Is this Halloweeny enough for you? Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill and today it's D&D because &D, I want to talk about witches. Not your contemporary uh, crystal collecting nouveau witches. No, I'm talking Macbeth. I'm talking Grimm's. Candle of hangman's fat pilot's thumb, tender liver of a newborn babe kind of witches. The ooky spooky stuff. All right. So first I want to uh, just talk a little bit about how I think about witches in my D&D &D setting and sitting setting in general. It's one of the most fun things to play with for me um, to, to vibe out the distinctions between different kinds of magic users. For new people who may not have heard before, I, I talk about this a lot, but there might be new people who don't know. So these are the Cliff's Notes. Magic in my setting. Is it high or low? Neither. It's pervasive. Ooh. Magic is everywhere. It's all around us. It's written on the mountain faces. It's written in the rain. I feel it in my fingers. I feel it in my toes. But despite its omnipresence, um, its, it's all-powerfulness is uh, generally inaccessible. Or at least it, it can't be um, tapped into in a very significant way with both power and control by mortals. Typically. That clear anything up? Who knows? And what's the vibe I'm always going for in my games? Say it with me now. Vague and evocative. There it is. So I like magic to feel deep. I like magic to feel supernatural in that it is the most natural thing. Great, now that you're caught up, I like my magic users to have different kind of relationships with magic. Wizards, of course, gain their magic through study, and so I like wizards to be, it's sort of, um, mathematical almost. You know, it's theories and equations, it's philosophy, it's alchemy, astronomy, all these sort of sciency approaches to magic. And so as a result, wizards have probably the most control over their magic use. However, it's at the expense of um, having access to really great, like, powerful, deep magic. Sorcerers have access to the deep and powerful real magic, but they don't necessarily have the training or the control. I did a video on how I would run wild magic sorcerers, uh, according to my own philosophies. You can check it out if you want. Witches, I think, are that place in between that has a real relationship with the, the true magical world. It's almost like they know how to work with it. They follow the flow of the magic. It's very careful tweaking and manipulating, which can make witches, you guessed it, very dangerous. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be baddies, although in this video we will mostly be talking about dealing with witches as baddies. Personally, my favorite uh, way to introduce a witch is in the context of a marketplace a la Stardust. I think it's something about the things that can be on sale and the prices that you might have to pay for them. Because for me, once you cross over into this sort of zone of magic, you're crossing over from a logic based on, you know, numbers and economy and whatever, to a logic based on language. If you have two like Wah! Oh, wind. That was very frightening. I'm not built for scary. If you have two left feet, or perhaps a lily liver, you could have them exchanged. You might order a change of mind. You might find for sale a, a bottle of moonshine or a broken promise. Sold at a discount, of course. Purchasing them might cost you time or luck, or maybe you'll be asked to make a trade. Things that might sound unattainable, but it's the wording that's important. Over the Garden Wall has some stellar examples of this kind of ambiguity. He's asked to find silver thread and a golden comb, and a spider's web and honeycomb are acceptable. See, magic is blending the lines between the metaphorical and the tangible. You know, your two left feet are metaphorical, they just mean that you're bad at dancing, but here that trade becomes literal. If you've watched a lot of my videos, you probably know that there's a city within my setting uh, where that sits sort of on um, ley lines or something of the sort. That means it has um, these waxing and waning barriers between the sort of prime material plane and a sort of slipstream side dimension. And every time my players walk through the market in this city, I roll a d20 behind the screen, and if it's a 20, they accidentally walk into the black magic black market. And it kind of all looks the same, but the inhabitants are different people. It's like two realities layered very closely on top of each other. Here they can meet a witch and they can try to make trades with her. She's more into the big sort of broad spectrum ideas. I don't engage with the silly scientific equations of wizards, my dear. No, here we deal in magic. In this context, it's all about making those deals with your words. It's almost like 
you're living in one big wish spell. Don't go crazy, it's not a wish spell. But I mean, if you find the right phrasing, maybe you can work something out. The other thing that I think would be very cool to do if you're introducing a major witch NPC in this sort of a manner, I like the idea that she would want to do a sort of a reading of anyone that she's going to have major dealings with. Some adventure paths from major RPGs have done sort of tarot readings. There's the card reading at the start of uh, Curse of Strahd. Curse of Crimson Throne from Pathfinder, if you're familiar, uh, has a running theme with a sort of tarot style deck. Those are cool, I like them a lot, but they don't feel dangerous enough to me. I don't know what it is, but uh, someone who offers to do you a tarot reading I, I'm more likely to trust them, I don't know why. So I devised a little bit more of a, uh, an ambiguous, are they trustworthy kind of a reading. We must consult the bones! The way I recommend doing this is that you uh, hold out your hand, and you ask each player to choose a die to represent their character, a single d6, and they each put their single d6 in your hand. Then with a very dramatic flourish, you drop all of these dice in the middle of the table, and you discern patterns from therein. I asked people on Twitter to make a single d6 die roll for me, and well heck, they provided! Got 131 replies, so I'm very sorry if you're not included, but I mean... Here we have Alan, Paper Curse, uh, Alex, and Rick Budd. I actually worked with both Alex and Rick Budd on, uh, on Amy Dallin's web series when I, I guest appeared in Future Girl. That's fun. We have a 1, a 2, a 6, and a 4. Now immediately looking at this little group I can say that discord amongst themselves will be their greatest enemy. For Alex's character I see personal change, and for Rick I see that he must be wary, for disaster could come about due to his self-doubt. This next group is a combination of, uh, of late to the party and also sentimental. Tom Wishford says, my first d6 for my first dice set. Cody says, here you go for my favorite set of dice. Cleverest Magpie says, am I late? Sorry, I took so long. And Mark Grant sprints in, hours late, waving a picture of a d6 while doubled over to catch breath. A three, a four, a two, and a four. Mmm, yes. Two of this party are more closely tied than they could know. David, Ducky Bread, Sarah, and Blair. We got a five, a five, a five, and a six. In a party of heroes, one will rise to an even greater challenge, but it will come with a sacrifice. Oh, this is a good one. Paul C, Nick Fireball, Stephanie Dulace. Stephanie do Lazy Town and Dresden Nova. There is great mercy to be found amongst this group. However, disaster looms as one harbors a dark secret. Basically, you're looking at the uh, group of numbers rolled, trying to find patterns there. He is a general code that you can consult. And then individually, I've uh, done a little color code depending on the dice that the person chooses to represent their character, and of course the number that they roll. In general, I tried to keep the, um, the group reading and the color reading very vague in terms of whether it's past, present, or future, because we can't predict the future, particularly in a game where we roll dice to simulate chance. So leaving room for these things to apply to a character's backstory, or their current sort of mindset within the game, or as something that might still be to come, gives you more wiggle room to make it fit. The individual character roles, the number, those are the ones that I let be a little bit more ooh, omens of the future to come. Still trying to keep them very broad. I really like that vibe of turning these dice into almost runes. And all of the players and their characters get to contribute something to this casting of the dice. There's something about it that feels like Oh yeah, destiny. I think part of what lends into this ambiguity of like whether they're trustworthy or not, if you think about um, the, the witches in Macbeth, the weird sisters. Weird in this context comes from a very ancient word basically meaning fate. And weirds, plural, sort of meant women or, or beings who have a hand in this destiny. And much as in Macbeth the witches play that role of destiny, you know, they tell Macbeth you're going to be king, which kicks off the events of the story, and that comes true, but how much of it was the witches, how much of it was Macbeth? Can you trust the witches because they were telling the truth, or are the witches baddies for revealing this piece of, of future, of, of destiny. And in terms of introducing a witch this way, for, for like a long-term campaign, I really love um, that idea of can you trust them, can't you trust them. You know, we've all seen NPCs who the twist is, oh, you know, this is someone that was a goodie all along that you could trust, and then twist, oh, they were really a baddie. But of course, why wouldn't you trust them if they're doing good things and being a goodie? Meanwhile, I kind of like the idea of introducing a character like, like this, a witch who, you know you shouldn't trust her, but as you continue to deal with her on and off throughout the campaign and things don't really go wrong, you start to just kind of forget 
that you shouldn't trust her and that she's dangerous. And then if you decide to have her turn out to be a villain, it's like, oh no! I just think that that would be fun. Oh my goodness, it's hot today. Hooey! Never forget, hydration is so important. But here's where my ideas about like facing off against a witch get a little bit more concrete. Again, this is just what I would like to do with it. That's all you get here. So looking into the history of witches, um, you get a very clear through line. To put it very simply, for a lot of history and for a lot of cultural depiction of witches, it's, uh, it's basically just a fear of powerful women and uh, any perversion of what is deemed to be a woman's natural role. This is a book called uh, Salome and Judas in the Cave of Sex. In this book there's discussion of the comparison between depictions of uh, powerful and magical men and depictions of powerful or magical women. And it gets into this zone where it's talking about how women have for millennia been depicted in connection to the earth, the moon, blood, whereas powerful magical men are tied more to the sky, the sun. It's very celestial, it's very cerebral. You know, even just think about um, wizards' towers versus witches' huts. You know, one is up here, way above us in the sky, you know, looking to the stars, looking to the heavens. One is down here in the muck. Not only that, think about the symbolism of a hut. You know, it's this domestic space. It's a home typically in the middle of some wild place, you know, a witch's hut in a swamp, a witch's hut in a forest. This should be a home, a comfort, but it isn't because we talked about the, the perversion of what women should be. So this safe domestic space is actually the dangerous thing. Children go there for safety and actually they're eaten. That's that common thread as well. The stealing of children, that, that twist on the maternal is a pretty straightforward one-to-one -one and I kind of feel bad for using it, but also it is the cultural consciousness uh, attached to witches as villains. We all know that I love using the shorthand of cultural consciousness, so I will! To me, the classic entry into a witch arc is that the party rolls into town in the middle of a witch trial. Typically a good aligned party is probably going to rescue whoever is being attacked as the witch, but you can use this scene as a good opportunity to introduce conflicting accounts of how to identify or defend against witches. You know, someone in the crowd is like, she turned me into a newt! Or someone else goes, she has a third nipple! But then your wizard does an arcana check and is like, I'm, I don't think that's really a sign of witchcraft. But the important thing is these different records. Oh, you have to drown a witch to kill her. No, it's burning. I would love to have a growing threat in the background that is the party having to manage the panic levels of the townsfolk. So it'll be your knowledge and your ability to persuade the townsfolk that you're right, pitted directly against the witch's lies and discord. Maybe it seems like the townsfolk are panicking over nothing until you really start to listen to the things that have been going wrong. You know, something simple like the crops are failing, that on its own doesn't seem like it has to be witches. Maybe the town is just overreacting? But then it starts to pile up. The well is running dry. The cows are giving sour milk. And the biggest indication of all the children are going missing. So what I suggest is that you as the DM keep a running record. It started like, I don't know, four or five or something. And every time the party convinces people to calm down a little bit, the number goes up. And every time a new sort of a curse seems to befall the people, it lowers. Storms out of season, plagued by nightmares. Just, just keep track of that number for now. And if that tracker ever reaches zero, it's full on mob mentality panic mode. They're going after any spellcaster that isn't tied to like wizardry or the church. So like bards, druids, sorcerers, warlocks, you gotta deal with all that before you can go after the witches and save the day. Or maybe you've kept the people from panicking, in which case well done you. Now for me, I like my witches to be on a little bit of a time crunch. I think it puts the pressure on, I think it gives a great reason for the witches to be doing so much all at once. The way that I would do this is by saying that the witches need to prepare this particular ritual before X event. You know, before the next full moon, before the solstice, you know, there's an eclipse coming up. The players have something like three days to discover the pattern and stop the witch. It becomes a race against time. I think a simple way to measure that sort of a time limit is to make it rest based. Just when you take a long rest, we cut to the next day. So during this time they're trying to track down information about witches. How do you fight them? How 
do you kill them? Try to find out about these specific witches. Where was the last kid seen and by whom? Who accused that person that was on trial at the beginning and why? Really just investigation mode gathering stuff. You could use familiars and the ambiguity of is this animal aligned with the witches? Am I just paranoid? But you could do something like have a crow that you notice multiple times throughout the day has just been sitting outside this house watching it. Hasn't moved all day. Maybe that's the house of the next target. Really want to play with that paranoia. Finally, the final confrontation with the witches themselves. Fight takes place in a sort of a witch's hut or a, you know, a secluded cave, you know. It's got to have that enclosed feeling. There are three witches in the coven because of course there are. It's funny, I was, I was trying to look up stuff about the power of three and all that was coming up was that one Doctor Who episode and Charmed. But it is a thing, it is a thing from before Charmed. The number three is very significant when you're talking about witchcraft, not to mention the connection that goes back to ancient Greece. If we talk about Hecate, the uh, the Greek goddess of witchcraft, we don't know an awful lot about Hecate, she doesn't show up in tons of stories, but what we do know about her is that she was a trinity goddess. In fact, in Roman her name is Trivia. Partially this is connected to her place as an underworld, deity. The underworld is consistently associated with the number three, the three fates, the three realms of Hades, the three-headed dog Cerberus who guards the three realms of Hades. Even Persephone herself is associated in some ways with the concept of the trinity goddess. Basically it's the maiden, the mother, and the crone. It's the the three stages of life and it's connected to womanhood. These are the, uh, the established three stages of womanhood. You are a maiden, then you are a mother, then you are a crone. Yep! That's all we are! Anyway, the point is, the number three is important to witchcraft, so there are three witches, and the power of three is gonna be important. Hopefully this doesn't get too convoluted, but bear with me, because I think it's pretty cool. Okay, so a big part of this is um, gonna be the idea that the witch's greatest strength is the trio. There are three of them to work together. I also want combat with them as a trio to feel kind of overwhelming and overpowering. Another very significant thing, I think of witches as not being, you know, I'ma zap you with my wand, straightforward damaging magic. No, they come at you from the side. They turn you on yourselves. So the idea is that there are kind of stages to this battle that encompass uh, while there are still three witches standing, while there are still two witches standing, and when there's only one left standing. Those are the three phases of this battle. While there are three witches standing, I want the focus to be on illusions. The difficulty with fighting a witch is that, you know, if you can get to them and hit them with your sword real hard, they're gonna fold. That part's fine. It's the getting to them that's gonna kill you. Maybe this would be overkill. I just think it'd be friggin' sick. Everyone rolls for initiative, you separate the party, and you bring them in one at a time, and you describe to that player what they see. As usual, you run it just like any other combat. But the thing is, up to three members of the party can be seeing something that isn't true. You bring the cleric in for their round and you say, you know, you're looking around, the witches are up here, this is what's going on around you. One of the marshals, like, like the fighter, runs up to try to fight them and then bursts into flames and you let the cleric do what the cleric's gonna do. Maybe the caster or the ranger in the group sees themselves being swarmed by crows. They react to that situation as they would. Maybe the barbarian goes to run forward but the earth softens beneath them, slows them down until deathly hands reach out and grab and hold them back. And the key is that some of these people are going to be seeing real things and having real things described to them, while other players are going to have things described to them that aren't real. There's no save for these illusions. You know why? Witches are using real, actual, deep magic. When they all come back together for the witch's turn, they're all in the room at the same time, suddenly they're going to start noticing things. They're going to be like, wait, you're not on fire. And it'll mess with them like an illusion would. I think it's a good idea to have an NPC there that you can target to kind of show how things work ahead of time. Give the players enough warning to try to navigate with it. The other thing that an NPC is useful for is that I want to build in an exploit, right? A, a floor in the Death Star plans that I can signal to the players to really give them a leg up. Because if you just throw a bunch of illusions at them and they try to brute force their way through, they're gonna get frustrated when that's not working. The exploit I would like to use is um, misdirection. Because that's kind of how the witches work, right? They mislead you, they deceive you. That's where their power is, as well as in the 
fact that they can be looking in three different directions at the same time. If you can direct their attention to the wrong place, they're focusing on the, the muscle-bound fighter trying to force his way up to them. That leaves room for, I don't know, the rogue over here to get up behind him and stab him in the back. So having an NPC is a nice way to start taunting the witches and playing into that arrogance and, you know, uh, driving their, their anger towards just your NPC. Even if you only have it work a little bit, it puts the idea in your players' heads that, oh, we can play a psychological game at the same time as combat is going on. It can be almost like, uh, like a beholder has facing. Facing is important for a beholder, but instead of an anti-magic field, it's just eyesight. So that illusion-based stuff is something that can only happen while all three witches are around. During that first phase, and also now while there are only two witches still standing, it becomes less illusion-based and more sort of abjuration-y. The focus now is just on protection. The focus here is sort of the more reaction-based stuff for the witches, I guess. It's casting shield against attacks. Maybe if someone gets up in the witch's faces, the witch can switch places with a different party member, so the attack hits the party member, and now the witch is further into the room where the party was standing. Maybe counter spells cast by the witches don't just stop a spell Dead, don't just cancel it out because this is real powerful magic remember maybe a counter spell from these witches sends the spell back at the caster for half damage or if it wasn't a damage dealing spell maybe there's some psychic feedback there are three witches acting as one so they get three reactions during the round the witches actual turn the action that they take on their turn during this first and second phase it is a classic maneuver for a witch to take control of her enemy's body but keep in mind these witches are only taking control of the body your mind is still free. You can see, speak, react to your body turning around and casting fireball at your friends, but you can't stop your body from doing it. There is a wisdom save for this style of enchantment, but with the power of three, you have to make three wisdom saves. Maybe you can scale it so like if you make two of your saves but you miss the third one, you still do the thing, you still swing the sword or cast the fireball, but you wrestle just enough control away that you can change the placement of the fireball and only hit one of your friends instead of two. Or you're pulling back enough on the sword that you deal less damage. But in order to actually stop yourself from doing it, you have to succeed a number of saves equal to the number of which is still alive. Three while three is still alive, two while two is still alive. I know that sounds crazy, but keep in mind this isn't an ongoing body control thing. As soon as you throw that fireball, as soon as you swing that sword, you are released. It is instantaneous. It, it takes up your reaction and I guess a spell slot, but then on your turn you are free to do what you will. This is like the main way that the witches are actually dealing damage, so I personally don't feel bad about, once again, giving them three actions on their turn, but maybe you would feel bad about doing this. If you feel bad, I recommend scaling back the number of actions they get in their turn rather than the saves thing. Because you really want to feel that power of three and you really want to feel the success every time you take down a witch. How much their power is lessened. Because it's really is that idea of the witches are multiplying their power by each other. You know, it's got that exponential quality to it. I mean, just look at the three, the weird sisters from Macbeth. At some point they're finishing a spell, they say thrice to thine and thrice to mine and thrice again to make up nine. Peace. The charms wound up. And that power curve goes back down the other way, baby. My mic is dying and I don't know when it died. Anyway, those are my ideas on witches. Maybe you have to like burn the witches' hearts in order to kill them for good or something. Maybe there was something in there somewhere that you enjoyed. I hope there was. I like not automatically making witches the bad guys, but also witches as bad guys can be a lot of fun. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma and I'll see you some other time. Hello. <gasps> good, 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 uh, good, good. It's haunted, is what it is. What? You, you're haunted. Haunted? Yeah.